Okay, we're live. Hey, everybody. Um, can you guys hear me? Um, just asking my tester people right now. People right now. I can hear you, but. Okay. Okay. Um, is there any way that you can put your speakers on mute? Because I can hear myself in an echo. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. <sighs> Guys, I can still hear myself echoing. Sorry, all of our DevCast students, we're just working this problem out. This is our first DevCast. Okay, I'm gonna do this without my headphones in here. Hey, everybody. Thank you all so much for being a part of our first ever DevCast tutorial. Um, we have got over 120 students today, which is pretty exciting. So no pressure, Richard. Um, before I put Richard in the driver's seat, I just wanted to cover a few things super quick. Um, my name is Ali Hackabarn and I'm part of our um, new developer experience team for the App Foundry. Um, just to let you know, this tutorial is going to be recorded and the link will, to the recording will be sent to you uh, by email when it's ready. Um, there's a resource box you can open containing links to the sample code and instructions. Um, if you're having trouble with the streaming web app, all of your troubleshooting has failed and you don't know what else to do, please email me at uh, developersupport at genesis.com. Um, and I, uh, I really want this to be with your time. Like, let me know what you thought about it um, at, again, developersupport at genesis.com. Um, so how this is going to work is Richard's going to give about a 20-minute tutorial on the Pure Cloud Embeddable Framework. And then um, we're going to have a 10-minute Q&A. So um, unfortunately, uh, due to the huge number of people in our audience today, uh, we're going to have you submit your questions by chat. Um, please you feel free to submit a question at any time during the tutorial, and then those of us who are working behind the scenes will try to answer while Richard is teaching. Um, if you, uh, and then of course at the end, we'll have a 10 minute Q&A, and you can submit your questions by chat. Um, I don't think there is anything else. Um, so without further ado, uh, take it away, Richard. All right, hi there, everyone. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about the pure cloud embeddable framework. Uh, so we're going to talk through why this, uh, why this might be important to you, how it helps solve certain development problems, um, and how you can leverage this to create more interesting integrations, uh, in the future. So first we're going to talk about what does it mean to actually build a client integration? So we've got pure cloud and it is this fantastic contact center platform that allows you to interact with your customers and do all sorts of wonderful things, taking recordings, doing quality management surveys after the fact, um, doing evaluations of your agent performance, all the workforce management things that are, that are built into our WFO offering. Um, we all know the, the great things that pure cloud is bringing to the table, but we have our own, uh, we have our own business application that we're interested in bringing PureCloud into. Um, so, you know, an, an example of this would be uh, like Genesis's um, integration to Salesforce. So we've got our PureCloud for Salesforce integration. What does it take to build something similar to that and then embed that inside of another system? Well, you have to have a pretty solid understanding of the pure cloud public APIs. Um, you can see all of those APIs are listed out on our developer center, but in order to just build a basic client that we're then going to take and stick inside of another system, we need to have an understanding of all of the different conversation APIs, all of the different notification endpoints, um, our presence APIs, uh, various parts of analytics, how uh, we're gonna interact with queues and more. But that's not it. 
On top of that, we have to go through and make sure that we've got our own regression testing around this client, that we handle platform deprecations if an endpoint in the public API is going to be moved and replaced with something else. As new features get implemented, we've got to make sure we're staying on top of that. Uh, you've got to figure out how do I deal with multiple browser tabs? How do I handle WebRTC audio? How do I deal with things like creating a UI to capture call logs and allow for agents to select appropriate context. Um, and all of that is just to build our little widget that we're going to stick inside of this external application that doesn't even talk about actually integrating to that application. So we haven't gotten into how am I going to handle um, how am I going to handle screen popping to a record? How am I going to take that call log and actually write it into some durable record that exists in my CRM or my ticketing system? How do I uh, collect the context of the workspace that my agent is working on and set that to send across um, to the next agent that we're transferring a call to. It, so far, we've only covered just what you need to do to have a small little widget that answers phone calls and sets an agent status. Um, so I want to ask the question, what if I told you that there was a better way to approach all of this? And that better way, in my opinion, is the Pure Cloud Embeddable Framework. So what the Pure Cloud Embeddable Framework is, is the core client that we use that underpins our Salesforce, Zendesk, Chrome, and Firefox integrations. Um, so it is an agent-focused user interface that's designed for handling the most common agent-focused um, tasks uh, related to interactions in the contacts of the platform. Um, so the kind of things that is handled by the that core client are uh, the management of interactions, the ability to select your status, the ability to select your phone, uh, the WebRTC audio handling, um, and some basic UI around call logging. Um, the purpose of the embeddable framework is to make building out integrations simpler. And it allows you guys to focus on what does it mean to have my contact center embedded inside this, this other web application that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to take over a significant amount of the workload involved in creating that client integration and let you focus on those more interesting things uh, about embedding a client into your third party application. So right now we're looking at a, uh, we're looking at a brief or a high level architecture overview of the embeddable framework. Um, so we've got all of our own static resources and our uh, API implementations um, stored as JavaScript files that we're hosting inside of AWS. Uh, we're using it to communicate back to the Pure Cloud platform. Um, it is represented as this client that you see on the right side of the slide here. Um, so everything that you see inside that client is all managed by us. That's developed by Genesis. Um, we take responsibility for, for that section of it and then provide an interface layer around that that provides notifications and a handful of JavaScript methods that we're going to make available to you um, that you can use to create that deep integration to your external application. So some of the key features that are available kind of out of the box for you are the ability to handle click to dials, um, the ability to set and monitor for custom interaction attributes. So as we're collecting information from callers that are in the IVR, we can actually set that as an attribute on our interaction. That can be bubbled all the way up to you as the call makes it um, all the way out to the agent. Uh, and then we can use that to drive other interesting behavior. Uh, you can also set those attributes so if there are uh, decision points within your agent's workflow, you can use some of the methods that we provide to start decorating your interactions with what the results of those decisions were. There, there's lots of different ways that you can take that. Um, we have uh, some subscription events that notify you of things like interaction state changes, uh, user events that would be things like changing of status, navigating to different views within the client, those sorts of things, um, as well as our own events around call logging. And I'll show you guys what all of these things look like in a few moments. 
Uh, so some of the other things that, uh, that we handle are a notification of screen pop events. Um, there is a mechanism to be able to designate workspaces for transfers to second aid, uh, secondary agents, uh, the ability to search your own web application for contacts or other custom objects and use that in the, uh, the dialing context menu, uh, access to ongoing chat transcripts, um, controls of interactions and user status selection from within your application, um, and also access to the user session token uh, so that you can utilize the rest of the Pure Cloud Public API for any of those calls that we may not have included directly in the embeddable framework. So it really provides a great extension point um, for you to get into pretty heavy customization. So I know everyone is here because they want to learn more and they want to get free stuff. I know I love free stuff. You love free stuff. We all love free stuff. Well, with the Abitable framework, you actually get free stuff. And the way that happens is by leveraging the ongoing development that we're doing in that core client. I mentioned that that client is the same one that underpins our Pure Cloud for Salesforce, Pure Cloud for Zendesk, Pure Cloud for Chrome, Pure Cloud for Firefox integrations that we are building and maintaining ourselves. We're going to continue to invest in that client. Um, we're going to be building out new agent focused uh, features in that client. We're going to be adding new interaction types. We're just in general going to continue to invest in those things. We're also going to be managing the ongoing um, care and maintenance of pure cloud platform APIs. So as certain endpoints get deprecated and get replaced with new versions, we're going to be the first ones to be leveraging those. And because all of those things are built into the core client, when we roll them out for our Salesforce integration, they get rolled out to all of the other integrations that are built on top of that same core client. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to be automatically updating the other things that you're building on top of the embeddable framework, but those things that are considered uh, part of that core client are part of our domain. We're, as we make those investments, you guys reap the benefits of those investments. So that's, that's where I come to, we're giving you free stuff. You guys are actually able to benefit on the investment that we're making in the Pure Cloud platform with no additional action required on your end. As soon as the uh, the next agent makes a page refresh with the latest deployed version uh, out in production, they're going to be accessing the latest version of the client. So like I said, there's really nothing for you to do. Um, a, a really good example of this is going to be um, WhatsApp messaging support. Uh, so this is actually already built into the, uh, the core client. Um, if you're in a pure cloud org that is utilizing WhatsApp messaging, this core client will absolutely handle all of that for you. As that whole process goes GA um, and uh, WhatsApp messaging is supported across all the orgs within pure cloud, everyone is going to be able to use our client to access those WhatsApp messages. And that includes anyone that has built their integrations on top of the embeddable framework. So there's probably a great question out there of how exactly does all of this work? So there's a couple of things that you need to do to uh, start taking advantage of the Pure Cloud Embeddable Framework. So it runs off of an implicit grant OAuth client that needs to be created inside of your Pure Cloud core. Uh, the implicit grant client allows you to impersonate a user. Um, it will use our standard uh, login page log in as a user and now provide that, that context for the client to say, what permissions does this person have? Um, you know, what stations do they have? What, uh, what queues are they associated with? It helps us drive sort of all of those person-based API calls uh, within our client. Um, the next thing you need to do is add an iframe within your web application. Uh, so the iframe is just a mechanism to say, I want to call in additional, um, I want to call in additional static resources from some other location, and I want to render them in this small space on my page. Um, then you need to create your framework.js file. So the framework.js file 
is one of the, um, it, it is the static resource that defines for our client how it's supposed to interface with your parent application. And that's gonna be part of our demo a little bit later on. So we'll kind of, we'll walk through what that looks like and, and how you'll, you'll leverage this to help implement your integration. Um, and then you're going to build out the methods that you want to use inside of your web application so you can communicate back to the embeddable framework client. Um, and then there's there's sort of two deployment pads, and we'll, we'll talk about those in a little more detail. Um, but basically, there is a public deployment path, uh, which means I've created a really great integration for what I believe is the next awesome CRM, and I want to sell it. I want to make it available through the App Foundry so that Pure Cloud customers can buy it and use it with this new awesome CRM. Um, the other option is to deploy it privately, which says I've got my own web application that I've built um, is really only appropriate to my organization. Um, and I don't want to make this available publicly. And we have deployment mechanisms that allow you to handle either of those. Um, the third one that's not really on this screen, but it's uh, what I'm actually going to be showcasing is running as local host, which is the, the mechanism that we're going to use to be able to do ongoing development. So we can make sure that everything's implemented appropriately before we actually submit it for uh, public deployment or upload it into my pure cloud org for private deployment. Um, once all of that's done, your JavaScript file is now actually hosted inside of Pure Cloud and referenced through a mypurecloud.com or uh, mypurecloud.de or whatever region you're operating out of. It, but it's referenced through one of those URLs. Um, and then you just load your web app and you point your iframe to that, uh, that URL that we've prescribed to you and everything is just gonna flow in and work. So I'm sure you guys are sitting there saying, I don't know about this. Seems a little too good to be true. Well, I'm going to uh, try and walk you guys through uh, a real rough example implementation. And we're going to talk about some of the things that you're, that you're actually able to do with the embeddable framework and, and try to piece it all together for you so you can have a little better understanding of how it works and feel a little more comfortable going out and experimenting yourself. Uh, so with that, I'm going to attempt to share my screen, uh, and we should be looking at, uh, how do I make that stop? Uh, so I'm trying to share my screen, and it does not look like it's doing what I want it to do. Thanks, Richard. I do see that uh, your screen is being shared, and uh, audience members, you're able to press the button up at the top right-hand side of your media player to expand your window if needed. All right, super. So then everyone should be looking at my IDE. Uh, so I'm personally just working out of Microsoft Code. Um, and what we're looking at is an example framework.js file. Um, so like I mentioned previously, this is how we're defining for our client how it's supposed to communicate with the parent application um, when certain events occur. So uh, there's a couple necessary components within the framework.js file in order to get you started uh, utilizing the embeddable framework. Uh, so the first thing that's really kind of important is the name of our application. Um, so this is used in a couple ways under the hood. You just need to come up with some name. It doesn't necessarily need to be uh, unique. It just needs to exist. Um, then there's a section called client IDs. So I mentioned uh, as one of the first things that you need to do, you need to go into your pure cloud org and create an implicit grant OAuth client. When you create that, it's gonna give you a client ID. Uh, you're gonna use this client IDs section to, um, to uh, take that client ID and place it into your framework file. Uh, so in this case, I'm working out of our development environment. So I've got an entry for it here. Uh, you would just take your client ID and plop it into whichever pure cloud region it is that you're operating out of. Um, then we've got some additional settings 
uh, that are optional to add. We've got defaults for all of them, um, but they are important to call out. Um, so the first one is our custom interaction attributes. Uh, so I'm gonna show a little bit more on this in a few moments, uh, but we are actually uh, broadcasting messages of a condensed version of our conversation model. And we're specifically looking for uh, these attributes on any of the nodes that they may appear in within the, the more complicated conversation object. Um, so we're taking that comp complicated conversation object, distilling it down to something that's, that's a little more uh, simple to consume on your end, um, and bubbling up all of these attributes onto an attributes node. And I'll show more of this in a moment. Um, but the important thing to remember is that specifically, we are only going to be surfacing these attributes. If I were to go and add another attribute onto my interaction that isn't in this list of things that I'm looking for, we're not going to bubble that up on the uh, condensed conversation object. Um, so this is really important if you're intending on using interaction attributes to key other behaviors inside your, your web application. Um, this is something that can actually be gathered dynamically. So, um, you know, if you wanted to structure this in a way that um, this fetches information from the parent application, uh, because you want to have a more dynamic configuration on this, that's absolutely available to you. Uh, you just want to make sure that you've got that structured appropriately so that uh, it, it operates within some of the time constraints uh, that, that exist. Um, and then we've got some of the settings that drive our client behavior. Um, and these are all documented on our uh, developer center, so I'm just going to cruise through them pretty quickly. But this governs sort of how the the user interface is generally going to behave within the, the embedded client. Um, so if call logging is not something that I want to engage in, I would be able to take this enable call logs node, set this to false, and now my call logs UI is just gone within the embedded client. Um, if I want to allow for transfer context, I need to enable this. If I want to hide certain aspects of the call log, I need to, I need to set that here. Um, if I want to search my, um, if I want to search my parent application for uh, transfer or dialing contacts, I need to set that here. Uh, and then we've also got the ability to change our um, our theme of our client, so we can modify the, the background color and the text color uh, within that theme node, um, so we can set it so that it matches the parent application. Um, and then lastly, we've got our um, initial setup function. Uh, so what we're doing is we're actually defining in here uh, how we're going to manage the subscription notification. So we're telling our application, how do I want to tell, we're telling our client, how do I want to tell the parent application that I've got a, uh, a new notification related to interactions or user actions or our notification topic? Um, and what I'm doing is I'm actually sending a uh, Windows post message. And in this case, I'm setting the domain to star. Um, that's kind of a bad practice. And I would, I, I really shouldn't be doing this, but it is, you know, sort of, um, it, it works. Uh, what I really should be doing is I should be scoping this to the parent domain of my parent application. Um, and that's something that can actually be passed down as a query string parameter. Um, it's something that I can um, I can hard code in here. Uh, it's something that I can have as my own JavaScript function to uh, raise a request to the parent application and say, hey, tell me what my domain should be and pass that in as a variable on, on all of these things. So a couple different ways that you can approach that. Um, but the important thing is that we've defined for our application, how am I going to tell you about um, an interaction or a user action or a notification subscription topic message? Um, so the Windows post message is generally the mechanism that we're going to use to communicate between our iframe and our parent application. Um, and then we've got some event listeners that are telling us what are the things that uh, what are the things that we want to listen for? So we've got our click to dial events, our add association events, um, and we're telling it to uh, parse the data that's being passed across when we invoke those functions from the parent application. Um, 
And then lastly, we're getting into uh, what do we do when we're uh, broadcasting other types of messages. So our process call log message or screen pop message, uh, there's a specific message type for opening a call log, um, and then also our function for executing contact searches. So um, there's a lot going on in this file. Like I said, this is how we're defining for the client how it's intended to interact with the parent application. Um, but now I want to show you kind of what it looks like in practice. Um, so here we are, we're looking at a very, very rudimentary uh, implementation. So we've got a very, very simple uh, web page. Uh, I'm actually going to show you what the HTML for that page looks like. Um, it's all here on a single page. You can see that there's there's really not a whole lot going on in the web page, and, and we did that very explicitly so that it's easy to see what is the relationship between the client and the individual methods that we're gonna be implementing. Um, the other thing that's important to note is I've got the source for my iframe defined here. Um, so we tell you exactly what the uh, the iframe sources are that you need in the developer center. Uh, there's one for working in a local environment. Um, so that's actually invoked by this query string parameter here that says I'm using my local environment. Uh, there's another one for private deployments. And then there's a separate URL for public deployments. Um, one important thing to note is that the iframe specifically needs to have access to the camera and the microphone uh, in order for uh, WebRTC audio signaling to happen. Um, and then the rest of the content on this page is all pretty simple, self-explanatory stuff. Um, and that results in this page here. So we've got our iframe source rendering over here. It's pulling from our framework.js file. Um, so let me uh, let me just kind of uh, prove that we're actually pulling this file in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just release uh, this. I'm going to delete. Uh, control -Z, control -X. I'm just going to delete all of that uh, from my theming. I'm going to save that. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to refresh the page. And when the client re-renders, uh, it should. Oh no, what did I do? I may have done something that didn't make it happy. Oh no. Of course, this is going to happen on a live demo. So I apologize to everyone here. I'll. Uh, let me put all of that back because I think I did something that I didn't quite expect. Uh, let's paste that back in and save that. <sighs> and we'll reload our page. So my dynamic demo is not so dynamic now, but we fixed it. We put everything back. Um, it wasn't quite as impactful as I was hoping for. I wanted to just change back to the default color. Um, but uh, here, I've got an idea. We'll just um, we'll delete that and save that. Try this. I may not like that either. Ah, apologies, folks. This is what I get for trying to do things on the fly. That's okay, Richard. I feel like this is the curse of the the live demo. Yeah, yeah, that is kind of kind of how it goes. Um, but yeah, so again, not as impactful as I was hoping for. I was hoping to show you guys some dynamic colors in there without having to look up a bunch of hex values. But you can see as we're saving that file and reloading the page, um, it's actually pulling that framework.js file, which dictates for the client how it's supposed to interact with uh, the parent application. And I suppose there's a good lesson in what I was doing. If you create something that's not a valid JavaScript file because it's got commas in the wrong place, or you aren't closing out a, a um, you aren't closing out a brace, or you know just something generally that makes it so that it's a, uh, a not 
valid JavaScript file, um, it is going to generate those sorts of errors. You're going to wind up seeing a spinner that appears because the client can't load the framework.js file, which tells us tells it how it's supposed to interact with the parent application. So hopefully there's something valuable in me continuing to screw up on, uh, on a live demo um, that you guys can take away with you. Anyways, um, so we've got our valid framework.js file. It's getting pulled in dynamically from my local server, um, and it's allowing me to make changes on the fly. I save my framework file, I reload the page, it pulls it in, and now I've got a new definition for how I'm communicating with the parent application. Um, as I mentioned before, the client itself is handling things like uh, my user status, so I'm able to leverage this menu here, set my status, I've got all of my call controls built in, I've got my global navigation uh, that allows me to create new interactions, I can go to my interaction log, um, uh, I can view agent performance, so you know I can see how many calls was I working on um, for uh, this time period, all of that fun stuff. All of these are sort of standard functions that are built into the client. Um, I've also got my own local settings uh, that I'm able to govern some of what the uh, some of what the defaults are using that framework.js file. Um, and then I've got a, a quick access to the resource center and back to my main pure cloud application. Um, but we'll go ahead and set ourselves back to the interaction view. So. Um, one of the things that, that I mentioned earlier is um, simple click to dial. So there's actually a JavaScript method that's defined uh, in the framework that tells us how I'm supposed to um, how I'm supposed to behave to uh, click to dial events. So I've got a um, I've got a clickable link here on the page. I'm going to click it. Um, and it is now populating this. I can have it automatically place the call for me. I can pre-populate the queue if I want to. There's uh, lots of different interesting extension points that I have on my click to dial event. Uh, but in this case, I'm just sending it over here. I'm gonna go ahead and place my call. Um, and you'll see that down here, it actually executed a contact search for me. Um, there are uh, call log events that are going on. Uh, so you can see that I'm placing an outbound interaction. I've got my interaction state change here. Uh, so if I put the call on hold, uh, you'll see that that updates. If I go to transfer this, I can, uh, where's my set transfer context? Uh, so you'll see when I uh, send my add transfer context, now I have the ability to transfer a workspace. I can select that. I'm going to do a search here. I'm going to search for my queue. Go ahead and transfer that. You'll see that I got a uh, wrap-up code. So I think that call was a success. I'm going to say done uh, under my... Um, so you can see that I'm getting interaction state changed events all the way along. Uh, you can see that I'm getting um, I'm getting new um, user actions. Uh, I've got uh, notifications for uh, modifying the selection of my uh, my interactions. And if I go to my call log, I can type my notes in here. So it's arms notes and I can request to open my call log. Uh, so you'll see that that was being passed across. Um, one of my interaction attributes that I was searching for um, was being sent there. If I was to update and add new custom attributes to it. Uh, so we'll go ahead and run another one. Um, so we've got an interaction ID. So let me go back here and we'll do another call there. I'm gonna put that one on hold so that I don't have to listen to it. Uh, but I've got my interaction ID. We're gonna go ahead and pop that in there. And we've got our 
Uh, example attribute is an example workspace key. We're going to send that data. Um, so that's actually attached to the interaction. So we've uh, sent updated attributes. But if I put this on hold, go to my call log and attempt to open the call log, uh, you'll notice that when I'm opening the call log, those attributes aren't on here. And that's because when we come back to this file, you'll see that that example workspace attribute is not in my list of things that I'm, that I'm monitoring for. Um, so that might be a good point to, uh, to dynamically uh, add that. So we're going to go ahead and we're gonna grab that. We're going to put that in there. We're going to save this file. I'm going to come back here. We'll go ahead and wrap up this call. We'll say that one was a failure. And uh, we'll disconnect it. I can go back to my interactions. And this time, uh, so we're going to refresh our page again. We'll place that call again. I'm going to put that on hold so that I don't have to listen to it. Oh, let's drag this out and get our new interaction ID. Now we're going to put our interaction ID in here. So this is the general payload that we're sending. So we're going to be sending a new attribute called example workspace key. We're going to send that data. We'll go create some notes. And what we should see is, uh, oh, well, of course, that's not working today. Oh, you're making a curly race, Richard. I think if you go back to where you hit send data, uh -huh. I think um, you're missing. It looks like you you didn't close your all your and uh just yep and that's thanks by the way to, to josh for letting us know that's what happened earlier with the live demo was if you were uh, um, you're missing a brace so thanks for that <laughs> uh so i am still not seeing it <sighs> two We're getting that. Yeah, I'm a little unclear on why that's not working. <sighs> Anyways, it may be that I've got something messed up in my uh, I've got something messed up in my framework file. Um, that's not really the important part. the The important part is trying to highlight some of the functionality that's available through the embeddable framework. Um, so we've got the uh, we've got the ability to fill out our own call logging view. Uh, we can select associations there. So uh, you can see I'm, I'm adding an association to uh, my currently selected interaction. When I make that selection, that's going to show up down in my, um, in my process call log. Um, uh, so that should have shown up down here in this uh, so you can see I've got a selected contact I've got my interaction ID uh, there should be additional attributes that are coming along on the interaction itself uh, I wonder if that's where this ended up um, but as there are as there are interaction state changes as I'm going around and uh, modifying my users status all of those are being broadcast up as notifications to the uh, to the parent application um, and then I think the, the important thing that I was trying to highlight here was there are methods to be able to communicate back down into the client. Um, so, you know, kind of reiterating, um, reiterating the, the value proposition of, of what we've got here. Um, what we're doing is we are, 
uh, creating that that core client for you and giving you a, a pre-built mechanism that handles a lot of the road functionality for, for interfacing with the contact center and then giving you some some pretty simple to implement mechanisms to be able to interact with uh, with that client. Um, so you know, again, I'll uh, so here I'm just manipulating the user status, and you'll see when I'm changing the status using that method, I'm also getting notifications that that status change has been successful. Um, I've got the ability to manipulate my interactions. I can pick it up, I can hit a secure pause, I can execute a transfer. Um, there's all sorts of interesting things that I can do there. Um, if I've got an inbound interaction, I'm getting screen pop events, I'm getting my call logging events. So what we're doing is we're taking that core contact center functionality and I'm distilling it down for you and then giving you notifications of all of the um, all of the state changes that are happening inside of uh, inside of that client. Um, so I suppose at this point it's worth um, reviewing sort of what the embeddable framework does and does not do. Um, so the embeddable framework handles the authentication back to pure cloud um, using that OAuth client ID that you provide. We actually direct you to the um, the login window. We collect their um, we collect their credentials, hit our auth API, return back a token. Uh, we handle all of the public API calls for those co core features that are included in the client. So, um, you know, pick up, disconnect, transfer, secure, pause, all of those things. We're handling all of that. Um, the WebRTC media handling is something that's handled by the client. Um, and there are mechanisms for working with um, either single tab, low page refresh environments, or multiple tab, high page refresh environments. Um, so we either bind directly to the client that's embedded inside of the iframe, or there's a pop out window that we'll provide uh, that can just run in the background and it can be the thing that we bind WebRTC media streams for you. But that that's one of the more complicated pieces of functionality in creating a client. Um, and it's handled for you using the embeddable framework. Um, if you're choosing to sell this through the App Foundry, uh, we actually handle the licensing and permissions um, and the gating of things within the um, within the embeddable framework itself. Um, and then lastly, we handle all of the the event streams to and from Pure Cloud for things like uh, interaction events, uh, user state change events, all, all of those things. Um, and then we'll broadcast off all the relevant data to your parent application. The things that the embeddable framework does not do um, are the actual interface with your parent application. Um, so we don't handle uh, client installs on your end. Uh, we don't actually execute the screen pops. We only notify you that there's information about a screen pop. We don't handle the writing of call logs into your web application. We just notify you that it happens. Um, you know, we, we get everything all the way up to that point where decisions need to be made on how you're interfacing with the parent application. And we provide all of the information that you need to make those decisions, but we don't handle the follow through to, uh, to interface with the, uh, the application itself. So I'm sure you guys are saying, this is fantastic. I want to use it now. How do I get it out there? Um, so for people that are planning on building against the embeddable framework to, um, to sell through, uh, to sell to pure cloud customers, the way we handle that is distributing it through the app foundry. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with the app foundry, I highly recommend going and checking it out. It's at appfoundry.genesis.com. Uh, it is our, um, curated marketplace for solutions applicable to the various Genesis, uh, contact center offerings, including pure cloud. Um, so people who are wishing to sell integrations built on top of the embeddable framework, it would get listed through the app foundry. Um, once you get selected as a partner to engage in app foundry sales, um, You'll submit your framework.js file for review. It will get a listing in the App Foundry, um, and now we'll be eligible for free trials and eventually click to purchase installs through the App Foundry. Um, all of the external processes, so um, 
uh, using an example, if uh, if you wanted to build an integration that works with uh, Zoho, um, the process of installing anything in Zoho is still handled external to the App Foundry, and that would need to be included in the install instructions of such a listing. Um, but uh, it could certainly be handled. The um, the access to the client uh, specific to Zoho uh, would be handled through the App Foundry. I've spent a lot of time talking about the App Foundry. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there saying, I don't really want to build something for the App Foundry. I've got my own in-house web application or this tiny CRM that no one else has ever heard of. And I just want to build an integration to that, either for me or for one of my customers. And you guys are saying, what about me? We've got you covered there too. Uh, so that is where the recent release of the private deployments of the Pure Cloud Embeddable Framework comes into play. Um, so for, for private deployments, there is an integration uh, that you install inside of your Pure Cloud app. So you go to admin integrations, add new, and you will find private embeddable framework as one of your options. When you install that, you'll see a small little place to upload a framework.js file to it. When you upload that framework.js file, it's now made available to anyone that is in a group or your entire pure cloud organization, but it's only your pure cloud organization. So when someone in another pure cloud organization logs in and checks what embeddable framework files do I have available? They're going to hear nothing, but people in your org are going to find your framework.js file. Um, there is a slightly different URL that you use for your iframe source, um, but otherwise everything else is the same, whether you're doing public deployments, private deployments, you're working off of local hosts, all of the methods and subscription events are exactly the same. Um, so for the people that are looking to build App Foundry applications, um, private deployments becomes an interesting stepping stone into the App Foundry. So I've built everything on my local development environment. I think it all works great. Now I wanna try it in something that's a little more production-like and I wanna have five or six agents start poking at it. I can use private deployments to test out that my framework files right, that all of my code running in my host applications right. I, I can really kind of get everything nailed down and then I can submit it for review. Or if you just have your, your own web application that you're wanting to build things for, you can use this as your production environment. Um, everything is set up to work exactly the same. Um, so, <sighs> Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the the gist of the embeddable framework, and I'm I'm really hoping that you guys are excited about this, as excited about this as I am. Um, you know, hopefully you guys get that. You know, this is something I'm really into, um, and and I feel like this is going to be a great addition to uh, your portfolio of tools when you're working with Pure Cloud. So with that, I. Th think uh, we've got some time to get into uh, into our Q and A. Uh, so one of the questions on here um, was, does user events also include selecting or deselecting of phones? Um, at the time, no. At this time, no, it doesn't. Um, that, that is kind of an interesting one, so I'm actually going to jot a note on there. Um, one of the things that, that could be done um, in, in order to get you kind of what you're looking for today is to use that session token and just do the, uh, the user.me call. Uh, I'm being reminded that our docs say, yes, it does. So I could be wrong on that. Um, luckily, I'm not the ultimate authority on that. Um, the answers to most of these questions should hopefully be available in our developer center and our resource center. Um, so if you go to developer.mypurecloud.com and search for um, embeddable framework, you should find all of the information that uh, that you want to um, that you want to know about the embeddable framework. Um, but we'll see if there's. Uh... Oh, Richard, we also have a resources panel. Oh, it looks yep. like um, someone. Asked another question if you want to answer that, and I'll. 
Yep. Uh, so they were asking for the path to uh, load the private framework file. Um, so actually, instead of just talking you through that, I will um, I will actually share my screen and we'll just walk through it live. Um, so I'm loading my main pure cloud screen. Uh, when this finishes loading, uh, we are going to go to admin. While I'm waiting, I'm going to take myself off queue so I don't get any surprise interactions. Um, once we're in admin, we're going to go to integrations. And we're going to go to add a new. And uh, here we'll search for embeddable. And you'll see we've got the private pure cloud embeddable framework. We're going to click install. Uh, it says I've got the maximum number, uh, which is five for an organization. So we'll go back here and we'll just uh, we'll look for. Uh, so these are all our embedded clients. Um, so I'll go into one that's active so you can see kind of what the configuration looks like in here. Um, so there's really two configuration elements. One of them is the framework.js file. You click upload new, and then it will give you a uh, screen to upload a new one. And then you've got the ability to do group filtering. Um, so this becomes really handy, especially if you are trying to um, do uh, beta testing within your organization, you want to create limited access or you want to run multiple different versions of the client for different groups within your business, um, you can actually select groups, which are your directory groups um, that the this particular instance of the embeddable framework is applicable to. Um, if you have a user that has access to more than one embeddable framework file, uh, they will actually, on their first login for the day, will um, they'll be prompted to select which version of the framework they want to run from. Um, and that will actually be pulled from the name of the framework file. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll give them the selection screen, they click that one, and then we cache that selection until they explicitly log out for the day. Um, so hopefully that uh, that answered uh, the question about how to get to the private embeddable framework and also about uh, running multiple embeddable frameworks. Um, so again, yes, you can run multiple. You can actually run up to five. Um, and if it's applicable, if all five are applicable to uh, a single user, when that user logs in first, they'll see a screen that asks them to pick which one do you want to use. Um, so hopefully that answers those questions. Um, and we'll hang out for a minute, see if there's any other questions that come in. Um, and if not, then uh, we may be able to give you guys a couple minutes of your day back. Let's see, does anybody else have any questions about the framework? Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to remind you guys that um, the re there's a resources list, um, which will give you links to um, tutorials and instructions, um, which are different um, resources that I think Richard mentioned a few times during this um, tutorial. But um, if you want to pursue it on your own, feel free to uh, check those out. And it looks like Joshua had another follow-up. Looks like we're getting some more questions. Go ahead. Yeah, and and I'm not I'm not quite sure that I'm going to need a little bit more context here. But yeah, at at any one point in time, you really only want one version of the framework running um, because that that would just get horribly convoluted on the back end to try and keep straight. Okay, which set of events am I supposed to fire on which tab? Um, and you know how, how am I supposed to be interacting to a lot of these other API calls? Um, so in general, yeah, you really only want to be running one version of this at at any given time. Um, but you do have the option to run up to five within your organization. Um, and that single instance, uh, the the single framework.js file that you're pulling down from the private uh, configuration, 
can be run across multiple tabs. So, um, you know, if you need to have three instances of your parent application open for, um, you know, to be able to look at multiple records simultaneously, so you're just clicking across tabs, uh, there is logic built into our client to synchronize things across multiple tabs, which is why you can really only have one instance of the framework.js file active at any given point in time because things would get really, really kind of crazy um, keeping all of that straight if you tried to run more. Um, okay. Rich, yeah, I think because we went um, a little bit over the um, over time here, if, if anyone has any additional questions, you are welcome to email our team at developer support at genesis.com um, or devfoundry at genesis.com. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask us any questions if you want. And again, we will be posting um, the recordings on our um, developer center and also emailing you links to the recordings. Um, is there anything else you wanted to, to add or uh, Walla or Richard? Nope. Okay. Well, awesome. Thank you guys for helping us launch this first DevCast. Um, appreciate you all being here and I hope you guys found it useful. Um, so have a great rest of your day, everybody. Hey, voila.